Look who's here. We can't hear you. I have time, Randy. <laughs> Put me on, will you? Okay, we're putting you on. So I'm going to do an I'm going to do an introduction, if I may. I'm going to do an introduction. But why don't you spend more time with your vice presidents? <laughs> spend more time with them. I have time. I really do, Randy. You're on. You're in. You're on. Believe it well, or not. I tell you what, but but you should you should talk more about the staff. They're doing a hell of a job. They really. are. I have time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. But that, you know, this is, to everyone who's here, this is how he cares. I love that, you know, we're going to have to get you an AFT mask. This is not the one with the filter in it, though. I, I We've got I a new... Have one. <laughs> so I want right. to actually, I want to actually, before uh, the Vice President speaks, but, you know, what that last panel was, and I hope you heard me, about how I saw the change when in that, and I've said this to your wife, that that work you made us do in those joint task forces, the one that, that you, that I, I, I had the honor to serve on, um, the, on the pre-K through secondary one, it was the, it, it was quintessential Joe Biden because it was, you know, you're asking experts to really help guide you worked out a uh, you know, process with Bernie so that people saw themselves in it. But when we really pressed about how to do things better, given the data we knew, given the expertise we had seen, I watched your people on the task force, your staff on the task force, not say, well, we have to, you know, these are the, these are the problems with it. I watched them say, let's figure out how to get this done. And I had heard you during one of our, you know, during the forum on education talk about how we need to deal with the whole child coming from your experience and, you know, as, and you've been so open about, you know, being a stutterer and having that kind of experience. Um, so I've watched you, um, you know, you know, talk about what high stakes testing has done. And I saw the change in the um, platform, and I saw the change in that committee, and that's why I wanted to say to those three ladies who are tough cookies that I see real hope in terms of that kind of change, but that's who you are, Mr. Vice President, and I just want you to know, before we start with the questions um, with, from, from our sure. amazing people, um, our amazing delegates, that just yesterday, our body, our delegate body, in this virtual way, endorsed you for president. You know that our executive council did it in the primary, but yesterday, by over 90%, you are now our endorsed candidate for the American Federation of Teachers for president, and we will do everything we can to get you elected, not just to defeat Donald Trump, but I want to say this again for our members. And I said this, I've said this to you, and I want them to hear it again, which is you are caring, you are effective, you are honest, and you are decent. This is not just about defeating Donald Trump and all of the things that he is and isn't in terms of chaotic, narcissistic, and things like that. The, 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 what you bring at this moment of time is what a nation needs in terms of the empathy, the understanding, the caring about people, the listening to people. I saw that throughout the Obama administration. You know I've often said that you are our go-to person. And just, it is just the, that, 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 that in some ways, you deciding to run at this moment, pre-COVID, and what we now need with three intersecting, intersecting crises, two of which you know how to solve, a health crisis. Actually, I would argue you can solve all three of them, but you've solved a health crisis before. You've solved a recession before. So in some ways, the country is, and we are really blessed that you decided to run this time and that you will be getting, not only you've, you've effectively gotten the nomination, but you will be, after the Democratic National Convention, the Democratic candidate, 
and ultimately we need you. We all need you as president. We need a country that can heal. We need a country that sees its soul and we need a country that is about how we get to our better angels. And, 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 and that's why I am so appreciative that you're here today, that I can say that to you directly in front of everyone. It's not just about the platform, as important as that is. It's about who you are and what you bring with you, your character, your soul, your empathy, your caring. This country needs that right now, and we are really, really blessed that you offer yourself up and decided to run at this moment. Well, Randy, thank you. I can't tell you how much it means to me, just personally, just you and me. It means a great deal to me. And uh, as you know, I'm often introduced myself appropriately as Jill's husband. But uh, I, I want to thank you, Randy, for not only your support, but your friendship. Um, you know, I uh, understand Lynn manuel was there earlier. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and he had so an announcement. Yes. That he endorsed me. And he had an and I know, I heard that. I heard that. And, and I want to offer my. Uh, my uh, congratulations to, uh, to Loretta, your secretary, uh, treasurer. I, I, I just, uh, I tell you what, it's well-deserved retirement, but I know you're not going to retire. I've never found an educator that really ultimately retires. Um, but for all of you, uh, the most important profession in America, that's what you're part of. And I don't just say that. I've been saying that for a long, long time. I'm not being solicitous. It's, it's, uh, it's not because I'm married to an educator. It's because uh, uh, you're the ones who give these kids confidence and believe in themselves. And, you know, I think the single most important thing that a child can be given, the single most important thing is confidence. Confidence that they can do something. Confidence to equip them to succeed. At least that's how I viewed it my whole life. You know, and these, as I've said before, these aren't somebody else's kids. They're all our kids. They're the kite strings that lift our national ambitions along. And who has hold of kite strings? You guys. You guys. You're the ones. So everything, everything that will be possible for our country tomorrow is going to be in large part thanks to what you do today. And that's not hyperbole. I mean, that's real. That's just a fact. As Jill said, you know, any country that out-educates is going to out-compete us. You know, I, I, you know, I, I know there's some... There, there's one issue that's the top of the mind right now, and that's the pandemic, and it should be the top of the mind. We saw this challenge coming, but we've been calling for the president to, to address this since as early as January. Um, but Donald Trump failed to take any action and testing and tracing and everything we need to get this under control, to get our educators and students back to the classroom safely. And he just every single opportunity has missed a chance or gone, taken us in the other direction. There's no mystery about what we need to be, what needs to be done. When we faced with a crisis back in 2009, 2009, we knew we had to stand up for educators. So when the president asked me to oversee that Recovery Act over $800 billion, we allocated $60 billion then, $60 billion to local school districts and saved 400,000 education yes, jobs. Yes, you did. Because the states didn't have the money. Yes, you did. Didn't have the money. But this time, when the pandemic struck, Trump has dropped the ball again. He didn't make you a priority. And now state and local governments are facing huge, huge budget shortfalls. And Speaker Pelosi and the House did their job. They passed the so-called HEROES Act, providing $915 billion for state and local governments. But Trump and the Senate Republicans refused to do their job. Yep. The, you know, the, the proposal put forward by Mitch McConnell is completely out of touch. It's meager support. They're offering for schools and local governments. It isn't close to what's needed. And it's being used as a cudgel to force schools to reopen when they may not be ready to reopen. No, and, and, and it doesn't fund educators. You know, this isn't a game. Right. We've lost more than 900,000 education jobs since the pandemic started due to the budget cuts. That's absolutely unacceptable. Two weeks ago, I put out my roadmap for opening our schools, another plan I hope the president would at least listen to. It's a plan driven by science. But Donald Trump may contend to continue to move and force educators and students back into the classroom without a plan to keep them safe. It's not about whether or not. This doesn't fly with me. It's, it's not about whether or not he cares about education. It's about he wants to make sure that the, he looks better. 
We yeah. need to implement national testing and tracing rules. We, you get your nurses the protective gear they need. Provide an adequate supply of masks to every school in America. Set effective national safety guidelines. Empower local decision makers to decide what's best for their community at the moment. And provide $90 billion in emergency funding to preserve these jobs and keep schools open. You know, we need to get this done and we need to get it done now. But this is only the start because once, once we get ahead of this pandemic, and it's going to be tough because you remember, Randy, I remember you asking me in one of the forums I was with, one of your folks asked, well, what am I going to do when I'm president? <laughs> I said, it will depend on what I'm left with. Right. No, I really mean it. Look at the damage that has been done just since March by this president not dealing with this pandemic. And God knows, if you look at the projections now, what's going to happen between now and January of 2021, it's catastrophic, some of the stuff being talked about. So we can't just go back to the way things were. Nope. We have to build back better. That means tripling funding for Title I schools, giving raises to the teachers that deserve it, getting you the resources you need. We, we, we need, look, we're going to double the number of school psychologists and counselors and nurses and social workers in schools. We badly need them, especially now. Right. We can tackle the mental health crisis. We can build the economy that's responsive to the needs of working families. We can provide affordable quality health care and elder care, ease the burden on caring for loved ones. We can make sure those of you who are early childhood educators can get a raise, new training and new opportunities. You know, here, here, here's the bottom line. So often, it's in the wake of the darkest moments that America has forged some of the most remarkable eras of progress. And I believe we're on the brink of one of those opportunities. If we can overcome this crisis, and I believe we can if we start doing the right things, we'll be in an incredibly strong position to make progress. So thank you for allowing me to join you. I know I, you know me, there's a lot more I want to say to you all, but there's so much you've done already. And you know, I want everybody to know, if any the, the press is listening, and they do know, you don't just represent educators, you represent a whole range <laughs> of, you represent nurses, you represent yeah. across the board. But every one of them are on the front line. Every one of them, every single one of them. And so I want to thank you for letting me uh, join the fight with you. And uh, Randy, thank you for your personal friendship. I appreciate it. And I want to just also say to you, um, Mr. Vice President, I want to thank um, um, your wife, Jill Biden, your wife and Elizabeth Warren did a reopening panel with us a couple of weeks ago, which yeah. was fabulous and and we had leaders from around the country this is in advance of you putting out your plan we had leaders from around the country talk about a lot of the issues and you could see their guidance in your plan and and in and you know you 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 often tease about how your wife is an educator but i think people don't actually realize that she has kept working as not just a, as a K-12 educator when you met her, but as a college edu educator when you were vice president. And, she, and, and there have been times when we were supposed to get together, but she was teaching, or, and she would never, ever, ever give up her teaching. And it is just that kind of commitment to children and to kids that we see from your family over and over and over again. So I want to say thank you well, to her. She's going through it a lot of your. Well, I want to say one thing about this. She's going through what a lot of you are going through yeah. right now. She's learning because you can be teaching how to teach remotely, and she's spending hours, four hours a day, trying to learn the technology to be <laughs> exactly. able to teach remotely. To so I mean, yeah, you know, so it's hard. An educator ne yeah. never stops getting right. educated. All right, exactly anyway, right. Sorry. And we know it would be back to be back in school, but we are also really appreciative, and I'm about to start the panel as I say this, we're really appreciative of the point you said about, um, you know, that you can't reopen schools where they're dangerous and that it's important in terms of the community and doing that. So, you know, the contrast again with the recklessness with Donald Trump and Betsy DeVos is obvious. So what we're gonna do, for the next half an hour is that we have several, we have three members 
who are going to actually ask you questions. And um, so instead of it just yes. being a conversation with us, rank and file members who are going to ask you questions. And the first is Priscilla Castro from the uh, UFT. And um, I'm going to just turn it over to Priscilla. Mr. Vice President, as you know, the AFT represents hey, teachers, paraprofessionals. Priscilla, the Vice President, ed. can you hear the Vice President? He just said hi. Hi, how think are she you? Can hear me, but that's okay. She just did. <laughs> how are you? Where, where are you speaking to me from? Where are you now? I am where at home. Where are you now speaking to me? I mean, where? Where's home? In Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, Brooklyn, she said. All right, that's all right. okay. This is um, the capital of the world. Exactly. This is well. I <laughs> now that I'm national okay. president, I can't say Brooklyn's the capital of the world anymore. But <laughs> we do love New York. I think what happens is the timing of the Zoom right. sometimes gets you know it, it. There's a little lag. Okay, Priscilla, go. Right. I'll be quiet. Okay, and, and Mr. The Vice President, anyway. as you know, the AFT represent teachers, paraprofessionals, higher ed, nurses, and health professionals. All of us in different ways are on the front line helping each other during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of COVID, states, cities, and towns had to pause much of the economy in order to prevent the virus from spreading. Now revenue is plummeting, unemployment is soaring, and they have huge unexpected expenses to protect health and safety. A situation made worse from the disinvestment we have had since the 2008 Great Recession. <coughs> Funding that has not been returned. Nearly every community is facing cuts. These cuts will affect education, healthcare, sanitation, reduce transit services, and operating hours at government offices, like the DMV, and threaten public safety, like closing fire stations and emergency responders. Already more than 500,000 educators have been let go and is estimated without federal aid, states and localities will need to lay off 2 million employees or more, which would be devastating to our public schools, universities, public services, our communities, and this will have an effect on our children's future. So my question to you, Mr. Vice President Joe Biden, what would the Biden administration do to help save the many jobs that are in jeopardy or have been lost and to help save our communities and our children. First of all, thank you for the question. Secondly, uh, this whole country owes teachers like you a debt of gratitude. You made an enormous sacrifice and you show so much creativity. And making the abrupt shift from to online learning, preserving some sense of stability and normality for kids and keeping them uh, uh, growing and keeping them learning and, 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 and the, the gap from widening. But preparing for the fall now is, has so much uncertainty. Now, first and foremost, Trump and McConnell have to stop playing political games with the HEROES Act, which is that allows for billions of dollars to go to state and local governments. As I know you know, Priscilla, the reason why cities, counties, and states, all, all, all of them across America, are laying off people is they have to balance their budgets. Their, bullet, their budgets have to be balanced. They can't have a deficit. And what happens is, because so little tax revenue is coming in, because Trump so badly mishandled the COVID virus and caused this spiral that's occurred, there is no money to be able to keep necessary people employed. And so what we literally are going to have to keep the nation going, and at a time when COVID has slashed those budgets, state and local budgets, the Trump Republicans are offering nothing to prevent these layoffs of teachers or first responders or to keep uh, helping residents who need it most. It's unacceptable. You know, it's bad for educators, it's bad for students, it's bad for communities, it's bad for universities, and it's going to further slow the growth and make unemployment even worse. We have to make sure the states get and local governments get full funding they need to prevent teacher layoffs, to help schools open, reopen safely this fall, only if they're in areas that can tolerate it. 
We have to make sure everyone can vote safely in November. This isn't math exercise. It's about you. It's about making sure educators, healthcare workers, public service workers don't see wages or job cuts. Because when they do, guess what? They put the entire community at risk. When you shut down a fire station, somebody's going to die in that neighborhood when there's a fire. That's what's going to happen. When you close out the ability to pick up the phone and call for help from a first responder, it's causing people great difficulty. When you lay off so many educators and janitors and bus drivers and folks who work in the school system and nurses, what happens? You not only cause them to put them in great difficulty and not being able to go back if they're able to go back, but you do one other thing. You slow the economy even further, even further. It's an economic interest of the country to get us out of this, to have these jobs maintained. People are dying, out of work, afraid for their children. The clock is ticking. And Congress has to act, has to act now. And as I said at the outset, uh, Priscilla, look, we went through a similar thing, not as a consequence of mishandling of a, COVID crisis, of a COVID crisis, but because we inherited the greatest recession short of a depression in American history. And the president put me in charge of a program that had, I had to get nigh almost 840 and end up billion dollars out in order to keep the economy from going into depression. And what we did, we took about 900 of that to make sure that we, in fact, went out and made sure that teachers kept their jobs, mm -hmm. educators kept their jobs, firefighters kept their jobs, law enforcement kept their jobs, nurses kept their jobs, hospital and clinics stayed open. That's what has to happen. That's what has to happen. And it generated economic growth. We came back, the economy grew, but that's what we have to do. And this is absolutely bizarre. And you have, I'm sorry to go on so long, you have the Republican leader in the Senate say, let the states go bankrupt. Well, that's wonderful, isn't it? Let the states go bankrupt. How does that help anyone? Anyone at all? So I, the first thing I would do if I were in charge right now is I would pass the HEROES Act and get $950 billion out there in order to make sure that we can keep the, the economy open, the states open, the fun, the, all the major functioning responsibilities continue to be able to be paid. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, and thank you, Priscilla. And Priscilla, just for people to know and for you to know, Mr. Vice President, Priscilla is not just from Brooklyn, uh, but she teaches kids um, with special needs. And so thank you, Priscilla. Keep up God the work. You. Thank you. And by the way, Priscilla, if I get elected, we're going to fully fund IDEA. We're going to fully fund it. Fabulous. Thank you, Priscilla. Stay safe. And then we, we have, we have um, what we've tried to do here is you know, have um, um, three people from three different areas in the country. And we have Rick Lucas here. And uh, Rick, why don't you uh, tell the Vice President who you are and where you're from? Hello, Mr. Vice President. My name is Rick Lucas. I'm a registered nurse at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, and president of my local bargaining unit. Ohio. <laughs> Nurses and health professionals across the country have been in the trenches taking care of our patients since February, hoping some modicum of coordination would appear over and over again. Amid PPE and equipment shortages, we have watched Donald Trump refuse to fully invoke the Defense Production Act, which has left many of us still with inadequate PPE and an inability for public health officials to conduct testing in our community. We have watched OSHA loosen worker protections during some of the most dangerous conditions some of us will ever work in. We've seen CDC promulgate guidance that was inadequate and has evolved into a website that is hard to follow and contains conflicting standards. Meanwhile, my colleagues and I go to work and take care of patients. We watch our patients say goodbye to relatives on FaceTime and die alone. Many of us go home at night after our shifts without adequate PPE, unable to sleep because we're not sure whether we're bringing COVID-19 home to our kids, 
our significant others, or our aging parents. The trauma we wear is real, and so much of it was avoidable. Meanwhile, our states and localities are trying to construct and implement disease surveillance programs in a public health system that has been defunded to the point of having no capacity for the robust testing, tracing, and isolation that is needed to stop this virus. I can only imagine how chaotic the distribution of a vaccine will be. And if the health inequities of COVID-19 has exposed are any indication, we should all be concerned and outraged. It will take years to reconcile the missteps and impact of our poor response to COVID-19. My question to you, Mr. Vice President, is how will a Biden administration work to ensure this doesn't happen again? You've asked the uh, most important question. First of all, let me start by saying that if there are any angels in heaven, they're all nurses, male and female. I've been a great consumer of health care. I watched what you do. I watched how you treat it and gave hope to my sons after their mom and sister were killed. I watched how you dealt with me when I was in ICU years ago with a cranial aneurysm. How you and I watched how, for such a long time, you took care of my, my son, Bo, when he had stage four glioblastoma and it was only months, not whether he'd live. So I think you're, the, you're in maybe the single most underestimated profession in the world. I really mean it. I'm not joking. You're incredible. And I've been saying that for the last 25 years. Unfortunately, I've been a significant consumer of your professionalism. Look, first, let me start off by thanking you for your courage and putting yourself on the line and your colleagues in your community every single day. And so many of you have died. So many of you have contracted COVID unnecessarily. My son-in-law is a leading surgeon in Philadelphia and uh, reconstructive plastic surgeon for cancer patients. And he, like all the other surgeons, sort of chipped in and dealt with the COVID side. The stories he's told early on about nurses putting garbage bags over their bodies as protection instead of because they don't have the protective equipment. You may recall way back in March, I laid out for the president that we should be having a program where we engage the Defense Production Act and use it. There isn't a single reason in the world why we're in a situation where you don't have and everyone else have the protective equipment they need. But he has, he has, he has dwaddled so, so much. Now we still have shortages. We have the inability, for example, as you well know, to even have some of the, uh, uh, the materials that are needed to swab your nose, right. little glass vials to tell all those, all those things. We're in our capacity to do, and we can do it quickly. But risking your lives, uh, they ask, we ask you to go out and risk your lives, fight the daily pandemic without supply, support, basic respect for science and for government, without any of that. You know, there's no, you know, the, the, the commander in chief, as he calls himself, and he is, has a duty to get all you need. Instead, Donald Trump's ignored the warnings, refused to prepare, failed to protect our nation. For months, as I said, we've called on the president to take four urgent steps to protect frontline heroes. One, get all essential workers priority access to PPE. Remember what he said initially when I was pushing that? He said, you guys are selling the PPE. You're stealing from stockpiles and selling it. What a wonderful, wonderful thing to say as you're risking your lives. I've told the, the nurses I know, because I speak with a lot of them, they're afraid to go home at night. They're trying to figure out they get a hotel room because they can, until they can shower and clean because they're afraid they'll walk into their home and their children or their, sp or their spouse or their significant other, or their mom or their dad, somebody's going to get it. Second thing. We ought to be able to get free COVID testing and paid sick leave for every worker called back to the job. We have to enforce clear workplace safety standards. OSHA is just an abomination. 
because corporate America doesn't like OSHA. They don't like them telling them what they have to do. When they had all these crises in the meatpacking plants, instead of slowing, instead of slowing things up, what they do? Sped up the line. How in God's name are you supposed to space people to be able to do their job, for example, and speed up the line? Four, Congress, Congress has to, we have to push it to get all the essential workers the premium pay they deserve. We can do that. And not only is it the right thing to do for them, but it helps the economy. <laughs> it helps the economy. When you don't have any money to spend, the economy contracts. Trump has done none of it. You know, I'll do that and a lot more to make sure we never are so unprepared for a pandemic again. Immediately get state and local governments the fiscal relief they need to keep vital public services running. Two, launch a fund for cash-strapped states and local health departments to stop new COVID outbreaks in the tracks. Three, build a new public health jobs corps, hiring 100,000 Americans to do contract, tra contract tracing and testing now and to fight environmental health issues, opioids, other health in inequities long term. Build on Obamacare. He's out in right now. The president is still in federal court trying to do away with health care. We have 100 million people who are covered because they have a pre-existing condition. 20 million people have never had it. He said, get rid of it all. We should build on that with a public option, a Medicare option, a public option. If you can't afford it, you automatically get covered. And we're going to restore the White House Office of Global Health Security. You know, when we left the office, President put together, our administration put together a pandemic office in the White House because we knew from the way we had to deal with three other uh, uh, serious diseases internationally, we knew that it, there were more to come. We didn't know this was coming for certain, but we put together and we had advanced people. We had, we had CDC having, we had CDC having people out in around the world to see in advance when these viruses were emerging. We had 44 people in China. He withdrew them from China. We have to boost funding for biomedical research and disease surveillance. We're not, we're not spending the money we need to. We have to re-engage with the world so we're ready to prevent the next outbreak. Walls don't stop diseases. We need to work together. And finally, as you note, we need a clear plan for the vaccine. I, months ago, I laid out, with the grace of God and the goodwill of the neighbors, as my grandpa would say, we're going to find a vaccine, hopefully sooner than later. But unless we do what I recommended he do relative to testing, unless you have a national plan, a commander who is like a, look, if we're at war and we had to decide how to get our aircraft and how to get our military persons to the place we most need them. What do you have? You have one commander in charge distributing those forces where they're needed, so he's the only one that knows exactly where it was, not leaving the localities. He's sending them out, or she's sending them out. Well, I, su I suggested uh, about two months ago now that we start back then to set up a commander in charge of how we will effectively and efficiently distribute a vaccine when it comes. A, you know, a massive task of safety, efficiency, and fairly producing and distributing this, this vaccine when it comes. Millions of lives and livelihoods depend on it. But does anybody think today, if God willing, all of a sudden we found, Lord Almighty, we woke up tomorrow morning and all of a sudden there's a vaccine. What do you think the chances are it gets distributed with any degree of equity and realization across this country to 340, 20 million people? So there's no planning. I don't know what this guy's doing. I'm calling on Trump to commit to three principles of integrity for the vaccine and the, and the development. One, the same principle I, he should follow and I'll follow as president. First, independent scientists and public health experts alone must determine when the vaccine is safe and effective. Two, that means no hype, no political pressure. The second thing is it has to be transparency. Clinical vaccine data must be made available to the public for independent expert review, independent expert review. And third, public report. 
from career FDA experts should submit written recommendations on any vaccine for public review and speak freely on their findings to the public before the Congress. Transparency. And you know we always have a problem with vaccines to begin with. There's a certain number of people who say, I'm not going to take them. Well, what do you think the people are going to do if the, if the president comes along and says, we got a vaccine that works? They're not going to take it unless we have full transparency. Exactly. But we need somebody right now putting together, and I proposed, a $250 billion plan to lay out exactly how it will be distributed if and when it is made available, God willing. But we need basic planning, basic planning, block and tackling. We didn't have to get in the mess we're in now. But first and foremost, the president has an obligation to ramp up extensively the PPE for all of you who are risking your lives every day. Well, we and can't wait. There are still shortages. <laughs> we can't wait till you're there to do that. And Rick has been. Um, I know. I know you have a hard stop, Mr. Vice first. President. And so I want to get to the last of the questions. But I want to just say, Rick Lucas has been that kind of champion over and over again. We have 200,000 healthcare workers, and I will never forget the call when Rick and his colleagues were talking to me about the lack of PPE. But I just want our members who have watched what you just did in this, you, you know, people, the, the knowledge that you have, when I, when I say to people, you get things done, the level of knowledge that you have about government and about how to use these levers and what to do, could you imagine if we had that kind of transparency on any of the issues that, um, that, that, that the uh, Trump administration is doing right now? The, the credibility, you said earlier on, and then I'm going to introduce Marguerite, you said earlier on one of the things that was so important uh, was about confidence, that kids have confidence that there be credibility. And, and just even in terms of just you riffing off what to do with a vaccine, that's how you give the public confidence. And I just want people to hear the kind of extensive knowledge that you have. I mean, I was, I'm sitting here writing down all these notes as you're just riffing off what you need to do on all these different things. It's pretty incredible. Well, you know, it's because I've hired people that are smarter than me. You know, I got a guy named Ron Klain who took care of the Ebola crisis. Right. He ran it. He's with me now. Right. I mean, I'm getting a nor every, every single, no, that's not true now, it's slowed up, but three days a week, I get an hour to an hour and a half briefing from the leading doctors in the country who are, who are experts in this area, laying out in detail what we should be, this is, anyway, and Rick, if you have any more questions for me, I'll be able to get your number. I'm happy to talk to you if you want to talk more about the, the plate of nurses right now. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I'm sorry. I know we're No, ahead. I know. Well, no, I'm just, I'm just worried about your time. We, you know, we love having you. Yeah, and, I'm supposed to do another you know. event. But. So let me, let me introduce um, our last questioner, um, um, Margaret Ruff. Marguerite, excuse me, it joins us from Philly, and she is a classroom assistant for special ed students and a member of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. Marguerite, I'm married to Philadelphia. Yes. Good afternoon and thank you. Um, most of us have seen and experienced racism and racial injustice in our, in our lives. As a nation, we had a breaking point in the middle of a pandemic and economic crisis when we watched George Floyd call out mama and he was murdered by police. It reminded me of my son who was, who was also murdered. I imagine my son calling out for me and not being able to protect him. What happened to George Floyd was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was awful. In the middle of the pandemic, we took to the streets, not only for George, but for all who preceded him, documented and undocumented. Enough. I work in Philly and have worked for students and my community for more than 19 years. And there are many small cuts that came before. 
under-resourced schools in our black and brown communities, stagnant wages for school staff from teachers to counselors to paraprofessionals like myself. We are the foundation of this country. I mean, we taught presidents and CEOs, and yet we have to fight for respect. The healthcare crisis is killing us at an excessive rate compared with everyone else. As president, what will you do to help fix the racial injustice? Not only this racism by police, but also systemically in our education and healthcare and economic structures. Well, first of all, let me say, uh, I'm sorry I'm for your loss. You know, uh, I, uh, I've lost two children. Um, one to a, an accident and one to a disease. And uh, it's the one thing a parent never anticipates. You feel like you're being sucked into a black hole inside your chest. You're going to just get lost and it never goes away. And uh, it doesn't take much to bring it back like it happened that very moment, whether it's in my case now with my last child lost, my son, five years. But you, uh, I can't imagine what witnessing what happened to George, because I've spent time with his family, did to bring everything racing back as if the very moment it was happening all over again. Um, and uh, gun violence in this country is a public health epidemic. Not just mass shootings that make the headlines, but also the daily violence that takes so many lives in communities. There's a mass shooting collectively in America every day. It's just made up of a whole lot of small numbers. And my thoughts and prayers aren't going to fix broken laws. We need leaders with the courage to stand up to the NRA and taken on the NRA and won before twice, but as president, I'm telling you what, I'm going to defeat him for good. And, um, but again, I, uh, my heart goes out to you. I know the feeling. As you said, we need much more than police and criminal justice reform if we're going to really rip out that injustice that, that is pre prevalent in society. And that's why I've made racial equity the central part of my Build Back Better plan. It's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to send you a copy of it, but I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about it here. And uh, uh, that's going to bring back us. We have an opportunity to turn um, something terrible into something good, because I think we've reached an inflection point. The country has had their blinders taken off, and they've seen, oh, my God, it really happens really happens. And so it covers everything from this plan I have, everything, infrastructure to housing to education. And it targets, it targets racial uh, um, wealth and income gaps to rebuild so we can build, rebuild strong, inclusive middle class that, that, uh, that deals everybody in. Right now, it's across the board. There's systemic racism in every single aspect of our society. Here's an example. I'm going to launch what they call, I call a small business opportunity initiative. Fancy, wonky thing to say, but it expands a program that President Obama and I put in place to boost investment into small businesses of color and to help, which are the foundations of the community. If the community doesn't have a local drugstore, community doesn't have a local supermarket, the community doesn't have a local uh, um, beauty shop, I mean, it's, it, they're, they're, they're the centers around which communities are built. And so we're going to also fight to end the deadly health inequities that COVID has amplified. For example, we expand Obamacare with a public option. It's the fastest way to get universal health care. And we can double the funding for health care centers that are vital on the front lines, that people can go to needing psychiatric help, needing mental health issues, dealing with drugs, and a whole range of other things. We can make coronavirus testing, treatment, and any vaccine free. 
that everyone has it. So we don't have to wait in line. Everybody gets it. I'm going to fight to give every child the same strong start in life. Offer universal pre-K for three and four years olds, number one. Number two, triple the funding for at-risk schools, Title I schools, to close the gap between the rich and the poor here from 15 to 45 billion a year. Boost teacher pay and teacher assistance pay because we're running short on teachers unrelated to the COVID virus. If we just had everything moving along like it was before, we're going to be short over a, another half a million teachers by 2025. We've got to expand the pipeline of educators of color. You know the numbers. All the great studies have pointed out that in, stu in, in schools where there are students of color, it makes a big difference if the teacher or the teacher's aide is of color. It fundamentally impacts their learning. It's real. It's not some, some quack thing. Well, great universities over the last six, eight years have produced these studies. And kids are more likely to stay in school if they have someone like them in the classroom teaching them or caring for them. That's why I'm going to fight to close the college race gap and ease the student debt crisis, you know, which has left black college graduates five times more likely, five times more likely than white graduates to have to default on their student loans because of their financial circumstances. We're going to fix, we're going to fix the public service long forgiveness, loan forgiveness program so that if you, in fact, continue to teach or do what you're doing and you're in school, your debt will be fully forgiven for school. If you do it and up to $10,000 a year in student debt is forgiven. We're going to make public colleges free for any family earning less than $125,000 a year. Free college. We're going to invest $5 billion in graduate teaching programs at HBCUs, historic black universities, college and universities. We're going to fund dual enrollment high school programs, which you're familiar with, a few in, in, in Philly, that train aspiring educators early while they're still in high school themselves and get college credits while they're moving. We have an enormous task ahead of us in rebuilding and re reinvigorating this economy. But every American deserves a strong foundation and needed to play the role. Last thing I'll say, you know, right now, there's one of the great things that I find that, and I know I went through it as a single parent for five years trying to raise two boys, is that the cost of childcare is astronomical. And if you are in that sandwich generation like you are, you may have a parent and or a child that has to be taken care of. And what happens? We don't pay, we, we don't pay childcare workers nearly enough. We don't pay the people who come in to take care of our parents nearly enough. But we can't afford, people can't afford to pay them because they don't have the money. So I set up a program whereby we're going to fund the training of and the advancement of people who are helping with elder care and child care so they can increase their capacity and their credentials while they are doing what they do. And that's going to create, the estimates are, 3 million good paying jobs. And it's going to allow all those women primarily who are single moms to be able to go back to work because they have a two or three year old at home that can be actually cared for and be in preschool. So there's so many just simple things we can do. And it's not just spent like turn on the faucet, spending government money. What it means is, and the, and the studies show it, that will increase more income in the pockets of people who are earning a decent wage, growing the economy. You show up and you, you get two new tires on your car. You're able to go out and you go to the grocery store. You're able to make sure you can fix the window and the house that's broken. You can do it. It increases economic growth. You know, I, uh, you're familiar probably with Claymont, Delaware, I suspect. It's not far from where you live in Philly, just on the Delaware border, the, the Pennsylvania border down by Marcus Hook and Chester and the like. And uh, when I was a kid uh, in grade school, early grades, my dad didn't have a job in Scranton, Pennsylvania, a working class neighborhood we lived in. And we moved down to my dad, known my family had gone to college, my dad and my mom. And um, we moved down to Claymont, Delaware. And it took a long while, it took about four years, my dad to get enough money to move out of what became Section 8 housing into um, being able to get a, 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 a nice split level home with 18,000, you know, it's now probably worth, I don't know, $125,000 these days. but. Um, 
And, and, and we, we did fine. My dad took care of us. But he used to have an expression. He said, Joey, and I think this is a core what you're talking about. A job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about respect. It's about your place in the community. It's about being able to look your kid in the eye and say, honey, it's going to be okay and mean it. Today, over 50% of the American people think their children will never even reach the standard of living that they have reached. And much of it has to do with systemic racism for Black, Latino, and Asian people. And it's real, but it's totally unnecessary. And by the way, I just don't say this when I'm talking to teachers or African-American women. I, talk, I say this to the Wall Street types because it's overwhelming the interest of the United States of America, that we grow the country, open up. My concluding comment, I know I'm staying too long. I'm overstaying my welcome here. But here's the deal. You, you know, don't overstay I your think welcome. that there are certain... You don't overstay your welcome. Okay, well, thank you. There are points in the history of every country, as a student of history in that are what we call inflection points, where you get, you reach a point where there's a chance to make a significant change for the better or worse in the country's future because of circumstances that have occurred. Well, as your president has said, we have COVID, we have high unemployment, and we have systemic racism, all hitting at one time. But this is one of those inflection points where the American people are finally saying, oh, my God, I didn't realize. I didn't realize how bad it was for so many people. And the example I'll give is when Franklin Roosevelt got elected in the middle of the Great Depression. I'm not Franklin Roosevelt. I'm not making myself out to be Roosevelt. But I've given a similar opportunity to find president. Because what did he do? He just didn't take us out of a recession. He built back better. We went from he realizing how many people have been left behind, so we ended up with a thing called Social Security. We ended up putting money into hospitals. We ended up putting my whole, didn't get nearly as far as we had to get, but it was a gigantic step from the way things were in 1930 by the time 1948 came around. Well, we're another one of those inflection points. I think the country's ready, and ironically, the things that can build back the country are the very things that can have a phenomenal impact on diminishing racism and making sure they're good paying jobs. Because we have to build now. We have to invest over a trillion dollars in infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges that aren't safe. We got to make sure we have, we have facilities that can produce energy that don't pollute the hell out of them and make sure that particularly communities of color on fence line communities and that, that are being hurt badly. Look at the number of African-Americans that have, have uh, diabetes. Look at the number of Americans that uh, African-Americans. Well, a lot of that goes back to what happens when they were kids. The, ac the, ac the absence of the right kind of food, the absence of making sure they lived in areas where you could breathe the, the air, where you could drink the water. Look at all the schools in America today. They're not sure you can turn on that water fountain and drink it when they were open. So there's so much we can do to make the country better, make us more competitive, and in the same process, give people a real chance. And I want to thank you for what you're doing. I really mean it. I know uh, <coughs> after what happened, it's hard to get up the next morning. But you're getting up to help other people. I found what it's worth. I never give anybody advice for things like this. But you know what? <clears throat> I found the only way to deal with the kind of tragedies you and I have talked about is purpose. Get up in the morning and have a purpose. And you have a purpose. And I promise you I share that purpose with you. I'm going to do my best. Do my best not to let you down. I promise. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Thank you, Marguerite, for your courage. Thank you, Rick, for your valor. 
Thank you, Priscilla, for your passion. That's who we represent, Mr. Vice President. That's who they are. And starting today, we are distributing our Biden for President shirts. I don't know if I'm getting it right, but we're, you're gonna see you people it. all over the country, remote, virtual, we're doing over 100,000 calls, emails every single day, and 83% of our membership was registered to vote last in the last uh, presidential. 73% voted. We're going to get that number up and up and up, and we're going to see Whoa. you in the White House. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My mom would say, God love you. Thank you. Any country that out-educates us is going to out-compete us. Don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget, and I will tell you what you value. I promise you one thing. If Jill and I end up in the White House, you're not going to ever have a better friend for education ever, ever, ever than you've had. I promise you that. There's an overwhelming need for wraparound support for you. You're expected to be a social worker. You're expected to be a counselor. Teaching is not what you do, it's who you are. He's actually willing to support and stand with us to get to our next step that we need to get to. No, these are not somebody else's kids. They're all our kids. We're gonna triple the amount of money we spend on Title I schools, from 15 billion to 45 billion a year. And I promise you, Randy, I will get it done. Teachers are often forced to use a scripted curriculum that rushes children through. Will you commit to ending the use of standardized testing in public schools? Yes. You should be able to set the dynamic as how to teach. Teaching to a test underestimates and, and, and discounts the things that are most important for students to know. We need to get out and vote and vote in mass numbers because our livelihoods depend upon it.